This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. It's an honor to be here today, and it's an honor to have, we'd be an honor to have either of these speakers. It's quite amazing for us in San Diego to have both of these speakers here today. I think one of the main reasons I'm at the podium um, is not just because I feel great synergy, no pun intended, uh, with the topic, but recently at a meeting, um, I got a look at the Heckman curve, and it actually, um, it kind of set off quite a reaction for me. I'm someone who's actually spent the past couple decades of my career funding, for the most part, young adult and adult training programs uh, in disadvantaged communities, first in my neighborhood of Boston where I grew up, and then here in San Diego. Quite proud of that system, quite proud of the work that some of the folks in this room do with that system. But the most frustrating thing in that system, the most challenging thing in that system, is that when you're working with young adults, and you're working with individuals who are adults in disadvantaged communities, and you're trying to get a $5,000 training program over six weeks or 13 months to make a difference, to help them get their foothold in the regional economy, in the mainstream economy, the most frustrating and challenging thing is it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work because so many of them come through the door with so many decades behind them of not having what they had to get prepared to do by the time they reach you. And so as I said, I think the people in that system do tremendous work and we put an awful lot of money into that system. And for someone who now does economic development, who tries to project this as a world-class economy to the rest of the world, which is a very fun job, and it's an amazing opportunity every day to get to represent the innovation economy here in San Diego and the small business entrepreneurs, when you get a chance to do that and you study this economy closely, you realize that the backbone of this economy and how we compete on a global scale is our workforce. In the backbone of that workforce, in every way, shape, or form is our education system and our ability to attract and retain the best and brightest people who we can. And if individuals are growing up in neighborhoods and are born into places where they don't have an opportunity to fairly compete in that education system or as part of that workforce and can't contribute to this incredible economy, then that's something that we all have to address together. And before I introduce the two amazing speakers, if you'll indulge me for a moment, my parents were Boston Public School teachers, and they are my two heroes in every way, shape, or form. And I remember being about seven years old, growing up in the neighborhood that I grew up in, and most parents in my neighborhood were not school teachers. Most parents in my neighborhood actually, um, both of them usually didn't work. Sometimes none of them worked. And so 200 feet away from me were my best friends, who I grew up with, three brothers, Billy, Scotty, and Paul, great Boston names. <laughs> and they sort of flanked me age-wise. So one was the same age as me, one was a year older, one was a year younger. They were like my three brothers. And they grew up in a very, very difficult household. Right next door, house looked exactly the same. Very, very difficult household. And I remember one day when a very bad episode with their family was playing out, out front of our homes, my mother called me in off of our front porch, and I remember my grandmother was there too, and my grandmother and my mother loved those boys. They loved all three of them. And I remember coming in and hearing my grandmother say, don't you wish you could just adopt them right now, Mary Ellen, to my mother? And I remember that stuck with me, even at that young age, and thinking to myself a little bit later in the day, Mom, why did Nana say that? She said, as she looked out the window and nodded at me, she said, because Billy, Scotty, and Paul are going to have a tough time in life, Mark. And there's going to be a lot of challenges for them, and it's not fair. And so I won't go on to tell you what's happened with them, but I can tell you that it's been very difficult for them. And they have had a lot of challenges in their life, and it's not fair. And so every day, as we think about the work that we do, the business institutions that we're a part of, the workforce development systems that we promote, and the education system behind them, that's the type of thing that drives me to make sure that we continue to think of an economy that works for all. And I think our two speakers today are experts in supporting that at the level that it needs to be supported at. When I took a look at the Heckman curve, the first thing that jumped out in my mind is all of the investment that's being made in a place that's paying off very little 
and how challenging it is for me to convince businesses every day that where the investment should be made is at the other end of that curve where it's paying off a lot. Businesses who would look at a balance sheet or any number of financial documents and recognize that right away. But when it comes to long-term educational investment, they may not be recognizing it. We are lucky today to have the following two speakers, and you have their full bios in front of you, so please read them, because either of these two could be headlining anywhere in the world right now. Um, but Dr. James Heckman, just a few things. Henry Schultz, Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago and a Nobel Prize winner in economics. Expert on the economics of human development. And J.B. Pritzker, from one of the most important investment families in the country and whose sibling, I have to say, plays a pretty significant role in my world as we are working so closely with the Department of Commerce all the time to make sure that we're continuing to promote America's economy on a global scale. So the principal backer, that family and that company and that philanthropic foundation of the first five-year fund and one of the nation's leading supporters of expanding quality, quality early learning, birth to age five, for disadvantaged children and for all children. So at this time, it is a huge honor to ask and invite J.B. Pritzker to come up to the microphone and say a few words. It, it is hard to follow a story about Billy, Scotty, and Paul. Um, that, that's, that's really an amazing uh, story and quite um, moving. Um, I. I want to thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks to many of you for volunteering the space uh, to do this and for being committed to the subject matter enough to have us here. Uh, I, I want to tell you that uh, we took off from Chicago yesterday. It was, um, there was projected to be about six inches of snow <laughs> on the ground. So I just want to say we hate you <laughs> here but we may stay, um, and, um, so really um, thank you, and thanks to Connie Matsui, and, and really I just, I am grateful for the opportunity to be here, and I had the opportunity earlier today, and so did Jim, to uh, speak to the larger community foundations organization uh, where they are doing amazing work and where so many of those communities from around the country that have large endowments and have lots of uh, donor-advised funds uh, are beginning to look at early childhood development as an important arena uh, for them. Um, I'm, of course, particularly grateful to be asked to join Professor Heckman and to share thoughts today on a subject that I care deeply about um, and that I believe is maybe the most important issue facing us in the country today, early childhood development. Um, so in truth, I mean, I'm a businessman. I'm not a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, no one will ever claim that I will ever win anything like that. I'm, uh, uh, you know, lucky to share a stage occasionally with uh, Professor Heckman. So I'll go from my heart and what I care about deeply and, and from the position that I, uh, that I come from. So I'm here to solicit you for your business. Um, I, it's, I, I want to make a pitch to you today. Um, it's a subject that I care about that's about making investments. And so if you're ready for my pitch, if you invest with me and you invest with Professor Heckman, uh, we can not only unlock human potential, but we can also get you a huge return on your investment. So do you want to hear the rest of my pitch? <laughs> OK, so here's the rest. Uh, in my day job, I'm a venture capital investor. Um, and a good venture capitalist sees opportunities to make investments in something that is small today but has the potential to grow into something really big and something that is, has impactful yield and returns. So, you know, how did we decide to make investments as a venture capital firm in uh, Facebook, in SpaceX, in Dollar Shave Club, in The Honest Company? How do we make those decisions? Well, we did research and we did beta testing uh, and we figured out through trial and error what works. And once we figured out what works, we made a big bet on it. And that's basically what I do every day. It's pretty simple. Um, I wake up every day and I do that. It's like what it says on my head and shoulders bottle, rinse and repeat <laughs> every day. Um, 
And when I think about the issue of early childhood development, I think about it like a business problem. It's an investment. It's an investment that pays dividends. It's an investment that pays real, tangible dollar dividends for taxpayers. And it pays real returns to society for nearly a lifetime after you make the initial investment. So I believe that the single greatest key to our nation's economic security, even potentially to our nation's survival, isn't liquidity in our capital markets or efficient industrial assets or uh, stabilized currency. Instead, our economic destiny as a nation is dependent upon educating the next generation. Put simply, early childhood education isn't just a social good, it's an economic imperative, it's a moral obligation. It's probably critical to our nation's security. In the US economy, products are built and services are provided and clients are served by people. And that's why employers crave employees who are knowledgeable, who are creative, analytical, who are independent, and will do almost anything to get great people to come work with us. So if we're really serious as a nation about our economic future, it's time to ask the simple question, are we building a high quality workforce that will allow the US to compete in this globally interconnected world? The answer is clearly no. And the result is that we're leaving behind so broad a swath of the next generation that our economic security is truly in danger. So here are some basic facts. There are about 24 million children currently between ages birth to five in the US. Half of those kids, so 12 million, live in low-income households, half. And half of those low-income children, when entering kindergarten, are unable to meet the basic standards, the most minimum standards, and are not ready to learn. Half that show up in kindergarten. That's six million children. So a quarter of all the children in the United States come from poor families, and they will arrive in their first classroom simply unprepared for their K-12 education. Over the past two decades, neuroscience and behavioral research has shown that a child's capacity to learn begins at birth, long before a child enters school. Now, that's probably not news to anybody in this room, but it seems like it's news to the world. But it's true. While good experiences can help the brain develop, well, poor experiences, poor experiences, severely impair cognitive skills, social emotional development, physical and mental health. Children who are exposed to fewer colors, to less touch, to less interaction with adults, fewer sights and sounds, and less language, actually end up with lower functioning brains. To ensure healthy development, young minds need nurturing relationships active engagement and interactive experiences. From the time of conception to the first day of kindergarten, a child's brain develops more fully and more quickly than at any other time in their lives. In fact, 90% of brain development occurs in the first five years of life, 90%. Babies are manufacturing 250,000 neurons per minute. 700 new neural connections are made every second, 700. And then, after age five, that slows to a trickle. And at around age eight, it virtually stops. So here's the most inf important fact that I want to convey to you today. For those children who are without appropriate nurturing care during the first five years of life, all the later interventions in the world, all of them, from kindergarten through high school, from remedial education to healthcare to job readiness, as expensive as they all are, all of those interventions cannot fully make up for the lack of nurturing care and stimulation, and therefore the lack of brain development during those first few years of life. So if you go home today with nothing else from what I've said, please remember this. After the first few years of a child's life, you can't fully recover the lost opportunity of an underdeveloped brain, period. 
So we have a precious five early years in which we uh, can have the greatest opportunity to teach and nurture America's most valuable resource, its children, particularly our low-income children. America yearns for not just smart people, but smart people with character to build lasting enterprise value. It's good for America's economy. It's good for the kids, too. Over 15 years ago, Professor Heckman won the Nobel Prize in economics. He's among the most influential economists in the world today. He is among those who carries significant weight on a subject that I carry, care deeply about. What I love about Professor Heckman is that his rich expertise and wisdom in human capital development has led him to become a champion for early intervention and the nation's strongest advocate, the strongest advocate for investment in early childhood development. Professor Ackman will share some insights regarding two key sets of personal skills. The first is cognition. Those are the things that we think about all the time about school, which encompasses our skills of gaining and synthesizing information. But cognitive skills are relatively ineffective without the second set of skills, attentiveness, persistence, impulse control, motivation, and sociability. Some people call these social-emotional skills. I like to call them character. Because those supposedly soft skills are what I look for in an employee. They are what West Point looks for in its new cadets. Uh, it is what all of us try to teach our children. What Professor Ackman will demonstrate is that it's the dynamic interplay of cognition and character that drives personal and economic prosperity and that crucially these skills are fostered in the first five years of life. He's led the charge and led me to deepen my investment and I hope you'll feel the same, your investment in very, very young children. It's my honor to welcome a man of brilliance and commitment, my very good friend, Jim Heckman. Okay, thank you very much. I, I was actually quite moved by uh, Mark Cafferty's uh, remarks about, uh, and I'll, I can't help but share a personal story, how I got into this business. Because about 20, 25 years ago, there was a program uh, that uh, is now defunct. It was a job training program that was launched actually under the Reagan administration in the 1980s. And by the late 80s and early 90s, there was, a, there was an attempt to, uh, it was called the Job Training Partnership Act. You probably remember that. And there was a, uh, and it's been succeeded by other programs. But one thing that I was engaged in with a group of people was looking at a randomized trial, long-term evaluation of what happened in the Job Training Partnership Act. And what we found was, what was found in a lot of the literature, that we took kids who were mostly disadvantaged, it was, there were some effects for certain groups, I'll explain in a minute, but largely speaking, the effects of the program were negative. They really did not lead. There was actually, there was some indication that for young males, it was actually a negative concept, truly negative, not just not conclusive, but negative effect of being in the job training program. And these programs were launched about 50 years ago, now 50 years ago, uh, in the War on Poverty, the great society that Lyndon Johnson stimulated. And that's a, that, that was a very optimistic era in American politics and, and public policy. But one of the key premises, and I think it was just an idealism there, and it was just based on ignorance. We didn't really know any better. Johnson and the designers of the war on poverty, the architects, were very conscious of the fact skills were important. But we didn't really know what the skills were. And the idea was that we should be fair to everybody. So the very young, so they launched Head Start, and they're very old, and they had a lot of job training programs, even programs for 45, 50, 55 year old unemployed steel workers. So this, and the record of a lot of the adult job training programs was really pretty negative. And it's a consistent body of negative evidence in the sense that for whatever reason, you could argue the intensity was limited and so forth, uh, that those programs didn't work. And so that led to kind of a pessimism. So I was involved in that study with a lot of others. That led to a kind of pessimism. And about the same time, if you remember, this is 20 years ago, there was a book by Herrnstein and Murray called The Bell Curve. And if you remember that book, 
that book basically said, you know, that ability is very important. It was cognitive ability, not what JB was talking about. Cognitive ability was very important, and that uh, there was a, and it was genetically determined, if you also remember, and that in fact the distribution of earnings and the distribution of outcome was actually going to be uh, uh, kind of fixed at birth by the genetics, and the notion was the modern economy, correctly, is more evaluating skills. It's looking for skills, and for him, skills were cognitive skills. And so he ended up, if you remember, the last papers, of last chapters in that book with the notion that, or they did, I should say, although it was really Murray who finished it, the idea that, well, we have a group of people who are genetically inferior, and what we should do with them is put them on reservations. We don't kill them off, not anymore, <laughs> but the idea was you would basically put them on reservations for the cognitively feeble. So I, I came out of this in the late 90s, you know, with the negative results on job training. Well, maybe he's right, you know. And I did interact some with Murray, as a matter of fact. He came around a fair amount. I thought it was an interesting point. But at the same time, I kept thinking, well, what's going on? And then meanwhile, I was very, very lucky. I went to a, a talk at the Erickson Institute, actually, down at Chicago. I don't know if you know the Erickson Institute. But there was a neuroscientist named Harry Shugani, who's actually still practicing at Wayne State. And he talked exactly about what JB was saying, about the importance and the fact the early years were very important. He showed brain development scans. My wife and I went to this just out of curiosity, and I was staggered. So I started reading up on this, and then the rest follows. What happened was my initial pessimism was turned into optimism, because what happened was that even though it was difficult to change the skills at later ages, even when we were talking about adolescent youth, uh, it nonetheless was possible to modify this. So what did that do? It changed a bunch of things in my thinking, and I think it's had an effect in, 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 the, in the world at large. We learned a couple of lessons, and I'll just summarize those lessons, because I would like to engage in this dialogue. Uh, but I think the one, thing, one lesson we learned was that the emphasis on cognitive skill, which was built into the American system. So if you look, for example, at cognitive psychology that was paramount, in all the educational instruction. Everybody thought about, and it's still embodied in versions of No Child Left Behind, and even the most responsible. So Bill Clinton, when, he was, when, you, when there was this crisis about American education 30 years ago, and many other well-intentioned government officials said, look, we really need some kind of accountability system. And the reigning best practice was we should look at accountability in cognitive skills. So it was, this led to No Child Left Behind and to a whole set of other issues. So what did we learn in the last 50 years? Well, one, two things happened. Uh, many things happened. But one thing that really was important that happened is we started collecting a lot of data. We started putting together evidence. And that was a legacy, actually, of Johnson's war on poverty. People don't recognize it. It's not something we talk about every day. But American public policy is far better informed than it was 50 years ago. When, when we had Michael Harrington's book about the other America, we basically didn't know any better. I mean, we didn't know. I mean, how do you know that it wouldn't be possible to take a 60, 70-year-old uh, retired steel worker and re-energize them? So and there was an intuition there. But you know, intuitions sometimes get weeded out, by, and sometimes by academic authorities, which in the end are false. But you know, they don't know any better. <laughs> I mean, there is a danger of too many academics uh, working on these things. So, so that was one thing, that we actually started realizing that there might be a life cycle of development, that we might start. And intuitively, everybody knew the early, every religious text. I can't think of any major religion that doesn't emphasize the importance of you know, early childhood. The Jesuits said, you know, give me a child till age five or six, and I will have a loyal Catholic for the rest of my life. <laughs> and this was true of everybody the, the, in every religion and every uh, cultural practice. So that, that was a common sense point of view, but we kind of ignored it. We knew it. We knew it intuitively. We didn't act on it. That's one point. But the other part, and also an intuitive point of view, was this word character that JB used. Character education is something that was actually central to the American educational system 150 years ago. Horace Mann, if you go to the common school, Mann has this great quotation. It was basically, you know, the least of what we teach in school is reading, writing, and arithmetic. And the greater lesson is the lesson of character and persistence and staying on course and so forth. Gradually, for a lot of reasons historically, I'm happy to go into it, it's a fascinating subject, that we gradually eliminated this, partly with separation of church and state, because the original common school 
was pretty much founded on Protestant theology, and which was very offensive to a lot of the new immigrant groups coming in to the United States. But the fact of the matter is, by the mid-60s also, the idea of character education became equated with you know, telling people about they should believe in this particular religious belief or read this particular version of the Bible or something of the sort. So these kinds of common sense things, which I think actually were part of American public policy, or at least informally, kind of got weeded out. And so we kind of lost the importance of these non-cognitive skills. And we didn't really un didn't formalize in our thinking that early years might be more important than later years. Now, part of it is this issue about social fairness. And I think this was a reigning concern in the 1960s, and it is a reigning concern today. People want to be fair. And so being fair means giving people a chance. But the question is, is what we learned is that the chance that we should be giving them may vary across the life cycle. It may well be that early childhood, the kind of program that, that we've been working on together, and I think it's really important, early childhood can, because of the malleability, those, those greatly, those, those development, uh, that early development, the early childhood programs um, can actually build a skill base. So when Murray was saying, well, we had these genetic determination of IQ, we realized, OK, uh, you know, that sounded pretty bad. But it turned out not to be true. And so that led to a whole, I don't know if you remember. I'm, I'm old enough, probably, that many of you don't uh, remember some of these debates. But in the wake of the war on poverty, there was an early evaluation of Head Start. And in fact, that became the basis for a whole flashpoint in American public policy. And it led to this article, famous article by Arthur Jensen, which was, you know, so basically, they evaluated Head Start a few years after kids were in Head Start, they ran an experiment. They found that the Head Start kids were no smarter, measured by IQ, than the ones who weren't in, uh, in the program. And the view was that it wouldn't work. And so Murray was basically echoing what Jensen concluded, which was these people, uh, these people being the people in the Head Start program, were just genetically dumb. We shouldn't think, we, you know, we can't use interventions. And so there were two fallacies with that. First of all, it was not true. Long-term follow-ups did show boosts in cognition. But also, they only looked at these cognitive skills. It was not, people started, to, they didn't value character. And in fact, there's a whole literature, we'll go into it if you're interested. But it led to a kind of a misallocation of American public policy. So anyway, to get to the, to the bottom line, I think what we have is a much more nuanced view of public policy now. And it came in the wake of our understanding data, following people, running experiments, collating the information from experiments, putting together not just experiments, but very rich longitudinal data files. Some of the same data that was launched by the war on poverty helped kill off one of the big initiatives. When Bill Clinton was president, if you remember, he got rid of AFDC and kind of the standard kind of programs that were being sponsored from leftovers from the, because the view was we weren't changing the mark on intergenerational poverty. The idea was we give people money and so and that was a perfectly good thing. You would use the, the notion of poverty yourself. you know. But we started having a deeper understanding of what poverty was. And poverty, as we understand it now, is not just money. Because you see, if, poverty is, of course, the way we measure it, is money. But actually, it's more than that. Because we've come to understand that it's not just money. And that was what the great experiment was launched by Johnson. We've also come to understand it had to do with parenting, encouragement, and basically this set of skills. And I think what we have now is a much more comprehensive notion. So that basically we think the early lives play a very important role for promoting social mobility, promoting equality. And then, miracle of miracles, when we started following these people using the same kind of experiments that were started but stopped in the, in the wake of the war on poverty on Head Start, what we found was, yes, actually IQ did fade out after about age 10, just like Jensen said, just like everybody said. And guess what? When we follow these people to age 40 and 50, these people have very high economic and social returns. And it came exactly through this mechanism of character skills and engagement. And surprise of surprise, even though these kids didn't have any higher IQ, it also turned out they actually did have higher test scores. Why? Because these achievement test scores involve more than just being smart. It's being motivated. So th this whole thing, so I could, we could go on for hours, and we don't want to go on for hours. But I think the structure is, and we think about the skills problem, and, and JB referred to this skills problem, it's an enormous problem. And, uh, and so we look, for example, at uh, this measure that's taken, this so-called International Adult Literacy Survey, that's taken every few, every few years. And it basically 
America, the United States, basically stacks up as, among all the OECD countries as the worst in terms of the percentage of people who are at the lowest rung of literacy and numeracy. Uh, we mentioned uh, another dimension of this is the fact that among children, among males, 16 to 24, 16 to 26, eligible for the draft, eligible for military service, only about 25 percent are actually qualified. They're mostly disqualified. A lot of it has to do with cognitive deficits and so forth. Now, these are preventable because we know from these interventions that we can do something about it. So then the, the, the structure is we have the skills problem. And how do, you, how do you promote skills? And that leads to another issue. If you, I could show you a bunch of slides, but I think I should probably just talk. And then uh, it's better. Yes, yeah, slides are, that's a defect. That that's, comes from me being a professor. And, 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 and I like to work. I like, like hundreds of slides. But nobody else likes it. And so, uh, uh, and so I, will, I will. But I will say, if you look at test score gaps, which is what sees a lot of attention between the haves and the have-nots. If you look at age 18, you see a tremendous gap between those kids who have parents who are college educated and those whose parents are high school dropouts, mothers primarily. OK, you see that gap. But if you look at the graph, you'll also see that those kids, that gap is there before they enter school. OK? That gap is there. And it's actually there at age three, which is the earliest age we can reliably measure these things. So now, wait a minute. You can say, oh, we're talking about genetics. That's a perfect eugenic argument, right? These people are born dumb uh, to dumb parents. The dumb parents didn't get education. So therefore, you know, this is just the manifestation of what Charles Murray was talking about. The answer is no. Because what we've done is we've actually randomly assigned these children, put them in different environments, enriched their, their, rich, their, neighbor, their, their, their local environment, their parenting environment, the school environments. And we then uh, track them against those who didn't receive such supplementation early life. And we find that they're much better, performing much better. But we need a much richer inventory of how we decide what's better, and a deeper understanding of what the skills are that are successful in life. So I think a good measure of how much the, the world has changed in terms of thinking about skills is a new report issued by the OECD. The OECD was the group that promotes the PISA exam. So every few years, you know, Shanghai is very proud. It has some of the highest uh, PISA scores in the world. And you go into China, and you go into, even Hong Kong is lower, and they're very, very envious. OK. <laughs> well, but the, but the OECD now is getting the point. It's only gotten it recently, but it's now starting to say we need to inventory exactly these character skills. Because they've been shown to be predictive. They're also highly malleable. And actually, they're highly malleable even to somewhat later ages. So even when we think we can't boost IQ, it might be very difficult to get pretty rank stable. As the idea is your rank in the IQ distribution is pretty well established, like JB was saying, 8, 9, 10, somewhere in that zone. It's still true that these character skills are more manipulable in the sense they actually are a target of opportunity. So we have a much deeper understanding. And I think when we go in and look at what the economic and social benefits are of these interventions, we have a deeper and more comprehensive evaluation system, looking at both cognitive and non-cognitive skills. But to come to the economic return, we can see substantial benefits. So we actually have computed the rate of return, the kind of rate of return that uh, venture capitalists worry about and, and should properly worry about, and many of you probably worry about. And what we found was that the rate of return on something like the Perry Preschool Program was somewhere between 7 to 10 percent per annum, per annum which is extremely high. If you look at the US stock market, average investment in equity between 45 and 2008, that's above that rate. Okay, So you're actually finding it's a very, very good investment. These are targeted towards uh, kids who are disadvantaged. It's providing family supplementation. We can talk about the details of those programs. But the other thing, so and then more recently, we did some studies. Which, and this blew people out. It blew me out. We also followed a group of, another group of, of children who are actually now followed in the wake of the Perry study, but in the, uh, Durham, uh, Raleigh, Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. Followed these children up to age 35. And we not only gave them the standard measures about employment, crime, participation in the larger society, but we also looked at health. We asked, well, how do they, how do they look in terms of health? And what we found that those children, actually now adults, have much lower risk factors 
for all the adult onset diseases, lower propensity for diabetes, lower cardiovascular conditions. And so what we actually see is there's not only a benefit that comes, but health. Now, how can that be? How can, well, it's because of the same notion of regulation, behavior, following, numeracy, getting engaged in the larger society. We find less smoking, less drinking, less engagement in unhealthy lifestyles in the wake of having these higher levels of cognitive and non-cognitive skills. So we're, you know, we're in the process of learning, but, but the fact of the matter is, is that we get a very high return for that intervention. Preliminary evidence is suggesting somewhere between 11 and 13% if we include the enhanced health benefits. So here you see is the notion that we're trying to offer. It's not just that we have a program. So you were mentioning job training. See, the typical profile is say, okay, we have the police over here, we need more police, and if you have more police, we'll reduce crime. And it's true, certainly true. You can also ask, what's the cost of hiring and training a policeman versus the cost of pre-K and reducing crime through that avenue? And it turns out it's about four or five to one more costly to hire police and use the prevention, uh, use the strategy of uh, kind of cracking down on children than actually investing them early on. So the theme is basically prevention of problems. And more than just prevention, which is kind of a negative notion, it's actually bolstering. It's actually expanding the opportunity sets for individuals. And I think that is what is, so that's, that's what, what we're saying. And it leads out to, to a higher skill level, a greater engagement, and I think a, a workforce that's going to be highly productive. So we can show you lots of slides, but that's the, that's the gist of it. So we've come a long way. We've come a long way in our understanding of what is effective. And we have a lot more to say, but we are, I think, on a track. And this early childhood uh, notion that was introduced by JB in his initial remarks, there's a lot of evidence supporting it, an accumulating body of evidence. It isn't just experiments. It's a lot of longitudinal studies. But the other thing is, it's also common sense. <laughs> so people, one time, there was, a fam there was a bestseller 10 years ago that said, never trust your common sense. Well, maybe so, but in this area here, common sense actually has very rigorous evidence supporting it. I think you should trust your common sense here, and uh, it actually has real dollars and cents valuation. So thank you very much. So thank you. Don't, don't go anywhere. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. I'm going to just, I have just a couple of uh, comments and then we're going to take questions and try to engage and, and, and of course I'm, I bow to the leadership, whatever it is that you would like to have happen here. But I wanted just to remind uh, everybody here that, um, you know, I, I, you, you heard it here and you heard it from me. I mean, I happen to believe this is a national crisis. 25% of our kids are getting left behind. 25% really left behind. And it is not only, you know, hugely detrimental and tragic for them, but it is also an anchor on the progress of the entire nation. And so we need to work together to solve these problems. We can do better. So I, uh, in an effort to try to make a difference in this regard, um, I worked with an organization called the Bridgespan Group to put together the best research in the field and interviewed uh, the leaders in early childhood, um, and of course, uh, Professor Heckman and others, funders, advocates, um, and we put together what sits on your chair. You may be sitting on it, it's very warm if you are. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I do want you to pull it out, and it, it just, it, we, we basically set out to answer four questions. What does the research tell us about the effectiveness of early childhood interventions? What outcomes matter most to make a difference for low-income kids? What are the most immediate impediments facing low-income kids? And what are the most effective investments to have meaningful impact on those very young children? And the result is that guide, Achieving Kindergarten Readiness for All Our Children. Um, it, it's an input, comes with a fact sheet if you don't want to read the entire thing right now, but I do recommend, it's, it's really not that boring. Um, it does have some of the slides uh, in it uh, that, you got, that you missed out on. Um, but think of it as a blueprint for what works. So to, for those of you who are thinking about, you know, where should I put my dollars or where should I encourage people to put their dollars, you know, what can I do to make a difference? Um, this highlights tangible opportunities for philanthropists and impact investors and community leaders and, very importantly, for your elected officials and for people who affect public policy. Very important for them to understand this. So um, after you read it, feel free to hand it to your 
representative. Um, so that's all I really had to say, but I, I, I want to either turn it over to the leadership or turn it over to the audience in case there are any questions. One thing, I'm going to preempt maybe the first question, and um, because we do have this valuable resource, and th thank you again for generously sharing this with us, um, I would draw everybody's attention to the Heckman curve on page 17. That's what I was saying verbally about the gap. The gap between the kids at 18 when they're about to enter college and the gap in terms of these test scores at age five and age three. That gap is real. And so, again, you know, I was at Princeton last weekend and we were talking with President Ice Gruber and others. A lot of the Ivy League schools are worried about minority enrollment in schools and they're taking strategies around 17 and 18. Some of those strategies can be very effective. But I've had a running argument with the former president of Princeton, Bill Bowen, who's written a lot on education, that really you shouldn't be thinking about 17 and 18. You might want to start even earlier about where the, where the ability is. Now let me, let me get to the point. I couldn't get, I know you don't want a second talk, so I won't do that. <laughs> but this is the curve. And this summarizes, it's an idealized curve, but it does summarize what a body of evidence shows. And why is that true? Because of something I haven't said, I didn't talk about in great detail, but what economists sometimes use the term dynamic complementarity. But that's, again, the common sense notion that skills beget skills, that you build an early skill base that makes later investment much more attractive. So part of the reason why the early returns are so high is precisely because it makes the later returns so high. It may be sound paradoxical, but it's not true. It's you're loaded into those early years, and they have very high returns. Now, the trouble is if you were to draw a graph about where American public policy on children is spent, it would be almost in the opposite curvature. We're spending a lot of money locking kids up. We're spending a lot of money combating crime. We're spending a lot of money on kind of remediation in schools. You know, and looking at things like uh, special education programs. And some of the real benefits are we just lay the base for what the future will be. We can make it easier to invest. So that's the curve. If you, I don't know if you want, that's probably more than enough. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, I will well leave that. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Norm? Uh, first of all, Dr. Heckman, thank you so much for providing intellectual rigor to what many of us figured was common sense. All right. <laughs> That's very important. Secondly, um, that curve for businessmen in the, in the crowd is basically a curve of compound interest. It is. That's yeah. exactly what it is. The third point is this. Um, <clears throat> you talked in your, in your talk, and on page 19 of your booklet, talked about, about um, the Perry Preschool and the Abercadarian uh, yes. School. Yes, right. They, the two of them shared three characteristics. They were expensive, intensive, and tiny. Now, tiny, so- You mean the samples? The samples, yes. Right, okay. So, so it's, it's very difficult to understand how we should understand what the results were out of those. But one of the things that, that makes me uncomfortable when we start talking about this and start going universal is what always seems to happen in uh, when programs are started. And that is programs are started by geniuses and for utilization by average people. What can you tell us about the intervening time from Perry Preschool toward now in terms of what we have learned about how to do this better, and how will we be able to, to ensure that average people can do the kind of things that are needed to make this uh, early childhood education effective? Okay, you have a lot, you ask a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, but uh, here, should I stand up here? And, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I actually, I'm completely uh, on board uh, with some of your questions, but let me, let me try to explain something. I know I've talked a lot about Perry and I've talked about ABC, a lot of other programs. And I, I think there's a deeper issue, which is the way we look at data in public policy. It's not just a, I'm not saying you should go off and replicate Perry or you should go off and replicate ABC. I'm an economist and what I'm trying to take out of this is what are the general principles we learn and you can also look at non-experimental data. Some of the same longitudinal data I referred to that grew out of Johnson's War on Poverty actually tracked 
lots of data on families over generations. It was exactly that data I was referring to that President Clinton used to reform welfare. He noticed that they weren't changing the cycle of poverty, that kids born in poverty in one generation, their parents on welfare, they weren't escaping at the rate that Linda Johnson had hoped they would. It wasn't just a question of showering money. You could reduce inequality at a point in time in terms of cash, but in terms of changing the culture, much more difficult. So what I want to argue is that it's not just a matter of one study or another study. I think that's, no, but that's a very important point. And, and also, I think the important point is to distill from those studies the essence of what was going on. Now, let me tell you what I think actually was going on. It's not just a question of saying, here's a particular curriculum. We should do whatever was done. I'll tell you what the Perry, we had a discussion, we had an interview with the Perry teachers, some of them still alive, who were there in, in Ypsilanti, Michigan in the 1960s. So we said, what curriculum did you follow? What did you do? And so we asked these people, and you know, they were fairly educated. Some of them weren't so, some of them were high school degree holders, and they weren't, they weren't particularly educated. Some of them were MAs, and I think maybe one was a PhD, but they were very. What did they do? They didn't have a curriculum. Nobody knew about Piaget. Nobody knew about Vygotsky, all these names that are now iconic in early childhood. He said, what did we do? What we did, they said, was we raised these children like we'd raise our own. That's the common sense notion. And I think that's the thing to take out of it. We, and what did we do? What did that do? So the non-experimental studies of family look closely at the nature of parent-child interactions, which are very intensive. So in the, some of the more successful families, and by success I mean the outcomes experienced by the children, just that measure of success. I don't want to make a judgment about who's doing what and, and, and making a, a judgment. But what happened is that, the, you know, look at like mothers who are like 14 years old. And, you know, they, they don't know much themselves. They dropped out of school. They don't know that, you know, drinking, smoking, uh, doing various, taking drugs will harm the fetus. A lot of people don't know. Indigenous populations, you know, if you go to Saskatchewan, for example, they have a huge problem with fetal alcohol syndrome. And part of it is the information I've just explained to the mother. So what I want to try to draw, so it's answering your question is, you're absolutely right. If you were to say, look, the, so on the point about the small size of the sample, let me just say this. Each of these samples is about 120 people, ABC and Perry. That sounds pretty small. Some people learn in college, need 100 or it's more than 100, so we're there, but it's not quite, it's very small. And Murray, in attacking, a lot of people attacking early childhood say, you know, the samples are too small. Well, the other side of the story is they're so small if you apply standard methods of statistical inference, you wouldn't find any results. I mean, there has been some criticism in the past that there were so many results presented that you're bound to find something statistically significant. But all the studies we've done have corrected for that in the following sense. You can say, well, I'm testing multiple hypotheses, and I find that after correcting for the fact that there may be a best, you know, I, if I search long enough, and I use like a 5% significance level, 5% of a null hypothesis of zero, all zeros, would show up significant. We're well above that 5% level and in many, many outcomes. So there are a lot of the questions that people say. I know Grover Whitehurst and this whole group uh, recently convened, I think, it was it Brookings? AEI, AEI had mm -hmm. this panel. They're saying, all you know, the samples are uh, too small and uh, on and on and on. But then I say, no. No, it's the common set of principles you extract across all of these. So we can look at what parents are doing. And what these early childhood programs are doing is exactly what the parents, what the Perry teachers are saying. It's enriching and enhancing the early family lives of those children. So I think we probably yeah. have some additional Okay, questions. fine. No, but I, that, that, I don't know if that answers all your question. But I would say that's a very common criticism. That's why I, I'm going on at this link. <laughs> Because yeah, I, no. I want to make the 30 sure. second, I, I, just 30 sure. second comment about it, oh. which is that expense that you talked about, gee, that's very expensive intervention, that's taken into account in these returns. Exactly. So, so I mean, it's not like, I mean, the, the, the expense gets you that return. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter that your investment was $1,000 or $100 or $5,000. And it's not the even. The return is, the, is what you get on those dollars invested. But in addition to the direct expense, you're also going to get the welfare cost of raising taxes, which you kind of, so that's also factored in here. So the 7 to 10% rate of return is after accounting for actually the direct cost of hiring the teachers and the cost of collecting taxes to finance those. 
And so that's why I think it's a fairly compelling study. And as you know, and it's true. But if you look at the evidence, I'm happy to send you the papers we've written, and we're writing more. But you are finding very strong precision about these estimates. And we're, and we're not advocating for very, very expensive interventions specifically. There are lots of scalable, much less expensive interventions. In fact, that's what I spend my time looking for and helping to evaluate the scalability of, because ultimately that's how we're going to get the federal, state, and local governments to adopt them. Right? right? They've got to be. They've got to feel less expensive. Exactly. Order, but the, but the reality is, the more expensive actually works too. But, but there is this sense, but, but just to follow up one minute on this, on this point. So the, the, common, no, the, common theme, the common theme that runs through this, though, is basically parenting. It's this interaction, one-on-one. Yeah. -on -one. And so there's a program that was launched in Jamaica many years ago, Sally Grantham McGregor. It was, very, it was locally adapted. I mean, these are, it was bare bones. But what did it do? It instructed the mothers how to read to the child. So a, some, some, a visitor came in. The visitor wasn't particularly well educated. Come in, use local materials to create guidebooks, coloring books. Say, hey, there's Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones is walking across the street. That model, very cheap, has actually turned out to be very successful. We looked at the kids in Jamaica. We followed them up to age 25. Much higher employment rates. Mm -hmm. More of the people in the treatment group were migrating either to the US or the UK. Uh, there were many, many benefits now being used in Colombia, uh, the country of Colombia, being used in, in India, being used in China. And so there are, but it's, it's an area of evolution. We really want to find out what's best practice and what's cheaper, right? I was embarrassed yeah. to interrupt you, so you No, <laughs> no, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Well, no, but it, this is a great question, and I think it kind of captures a lot of the it does? antagonism. And I, I know Sandy was, Sandy was waiting. Oh. So before coming to uh, AVID, I was a school superintendent for almost 20 years in three different states. So strong, strong believer in all of the concepts. And uh, I have a policy question. The policy question I have is if we were looking for uh, a positive example, an exemplar in our nation of a community that has grabbed a hold of this concept, whether it's a early childhood initiative that's done through an education agency or it's a public communications campaign, which is what Dr. Heckman was describing. Uh, do you have an example for us to think about? And my second question, because as a superintendent, it always felt like when the educators were the only ones advocating for it, the lever wasn't strong enough. The second part to the question is, if there is an exemplar that we should look to, who did they use as the levers to help make the policy change more of a reality. So I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Pritzker to respond to this. Sure. Um, uh, first comment is because you know we could talk about community level or program level because they're sort of slightly different. I mean, some communities have adopted certain programs. That doesn't mean the whole community of of kids in need have, have benefited because they haven't gotten all the program. Um, but I, I just maybe I'll I'll speak to the question of you know what what works. Um, and, and what the legislators, for example, have grabbed onto. Um, there, I mean, we, we, I think we're all fairly uh, consistently aware that preschool is on everybody's mind, and lots of politicians have run for office with that as, as a, a plank of their uh, you know, offering as a candidate, and then actually followed through as mayors or as congressmen you know, and advocating for it or in the state legislature or governors. Um, so, so preschool is certainly the, the one that's at top of mind and has, has big impact. But yeah, I'm glad this is still up. Uh, but you, know, you can see that the returns on preschool are much lower, much lower than the returns on zero to three. And so the interventions in zero to three that we know work, by the way, are home visitation, just as an example. Yeah. Home visitation works. Now, there's an expensive version of home visitation, and there's a less expensive version of home visitation. And there's been lots of study on, on these home visitation programs. But the critical component of it is reaching the parent, mm -hmm. right? The parent is the, the, the first and best teacher for a child. And if you can reach a parent, almost every parent, almost, uh, wants to be a good parent. Mo many don't know how to be a good parent. They don't know what components make for a good early learning experience when they're babies, when they're infants, toddlers, et cetera. And so giving that information 
to them, even if it's just one touch with, as you were suggesting, you know, is like some suggestions about read, sing, play, right, and reminders of that. So, so to the extent that, you know, so we know what works and we know what there are some scalable versions of these things. Some of them, by the way, are texting programs. So, you know, almost every poor parent in America has a smartphone. And there are programs just reminding parents what things work. And they just, they want to know. They want to know and they want to do these things. And they'll find time to do them. But um, back to, you know, kind of getting communities to buy in. And um, it, it is very hard. I, I, we, we got involved in, I'll talk about this, it's interesting, social impact bonds. But basically bringing preschool to Utah, a state where the political environment for preschool is, is hard. Um, and we, we did it, you know, we did it with a, a finance plan that made sense for, for Utah, for Salt Lake. Um, it, it got uh, community engagement in it and support for it because, frankly, because we showed them what the results would look like. And, and so we started with that. There's resistance on both ends for, for preschool, for example, there, and any kind of early childhood intervention. Right? On one end of the political spectrum, the, the resistance is uh, uh, you're interfering with the parent-child relationship. Right. You're somehow interceding. The government is being paternalistic and getting engaged in something that should be a private matter. That's one side of the political spectrum. On the other side of the political spectrum are views that, well, in, with a social impact bond, you know, why, is, why are private investors getting involved in doing something government should do? The government should get all the returns on this. The taxpayers should get all the returns. Well, I, I happen to agree with that. I mean, the government should put forward. But how many people think, how many people have a surplus in their local, state, or federal government right now? None. Um, and yeah, I know this is a sensitive topic. Uh, here in California, I'm from Illinois. So we, we really, anyway, we're just below you guys. Um, uh, in dealing with these things. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so, so there is a, a way to galvanize support, about, and there have been communities, I mean, Tulsa, just to give you one example of a community, really has rallied around this idea of early intervention, and they really have put real money into it. And you say, Tulsa, Oklahoma, gee, you're California. You've got this figured out. They've got it figured out in Tulsa. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I say one last word? Sure. <laughs> No, just following up what JV was saying, I think the most important thing is to really understand the parent and then to also understand to voluntarily work with the parent. The last thing on earth you want, even so the right word was paternalistic. If you're in a system of saying you're inferior, here's the overlord coming into your family, that's going to fail. And it has failed in the past. We know that. The important thing is that you make it voluntary, cooperative, and you make sure that the parents are on board. Because if they're not on board, the whole thing is going to fail. It's just that simple. So anyway. Thank you. Thank you.